אוקיי? הלו אברי וואן, היו איר מי וואל היו. So uh, starting, starting with the introduction, so my name is Eyal Paz, uh, I'm the VP of Research at Oak Security. Uh, Oak Security is an, an uh, ASPM company. Uh, basically a lot of what we're going to, to see here, this is a, com a common problem that uh, we, uh, we are also trying to tackle and we are working to, uh, to building tools to improve it in our uh, daily uh, work. I'm coming from a network, before uh, uh, coming into application security, I spent about 11 years in network security, working uh, for Checkpoint, and I'm also doing my PhD research in parallel. So thank, thank you everyone for coming, I'm Liad. Uh, I started as a script kiddie back in the days. Now I'm on the other side building systems for the defenders. I also like bongers, so if you know the best bonger in town in Lisbon, talk to me after the talk. Okay. So if you are a developer uh, or uh, working in software for a while, I guess you saw uh, this kind of uh, uh, console log uh, uh, at some point. So this is a typical NPM install uh, STD out. And I remember the first time that I saw this uh, uh, output. I was shocked. This, I, I, came, I came in uh, from Python development, and when the, the first time that I was working on a, a JavaScript project, I was shocked because I got this message of dozens of vulnerabilities. Some of them are high, some of them are critical. Uh, it really, really blew my mind. And I, when I asked the developer who was working on the project what is going on here, he said, ah, ignore, it's fine, don't worry about it. So this is one of the most common uh, 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 widespread uh, problems that AppSex uh, teams deal with today. There's a lot of vulnerabilities, but, and everybody knows about it, but developers became blind to it and they are not really willing to do anything about it. And sometimes for a good reason. And this is cause a really, really big problem for security posture, because this is exactly like the fable of the boy who cried wolf. Because it's enough for this one time for the vulnerability to actually be exploitable in an environment which is accessible from the internet, or from other uh, compromise station, and this could lead an entire uh, attack chain. And the wolves are out there, meaning that there, there are so many vulnerability. Eventually, this one vulnerability is going to be exploited, and there are so many to count from. So taking for, uh, for the discussion today in the talk, we will use this parse server application. Now, parse server, it's a very, very common uh, project. Basically, it's a generic uh, backend infrastructure for full stack projects. It was originally uh, maintained by Meta, and then it moved completely to the community. This project is really, really well maintained, and it gets frequent updates. So you can see that just last month we got another update uh, to the to the main uh, alpha uh, release, uh, and it's consistently being uh, there's commits almost every day. So what we did, we took uh, this project, and we, we we iterate through the vulnerabilities that it has, the open source vulnerability. And we uh, found a really, really simple way to implement uh, an exploit upon this uh, open source application. So basically what you can see here is that we're running the application, we're starting to send uh, legitimate traffic, and then we are running our POC code, which basically creates a, a malicious request to the server, which very, very, very simply uh, crashes the, uh, the server. So how, how we did that? Basically, we took a POC code, which is available as a part of the advisory. The POC code is very, very short, and you can see uh, it's on the left. On the right side, 
is a network capture of what, uh, what is actually how the request is, uh, uh, looks like. It's just a lot of uh, headers, and basically it causes, uh, uh, it triggers the, the exploit of this uh, vulnerability. So the research, the first re research question that we wanted to answer on is what is the, so we saw this one case when we successful, successfully exploited an open source vulnerability. Now what is the likelihood for, for that to be on any arbitrary uh, open source uh, direct uh, vulnerability? So as AppSec uh, professionals, the process of deciding if a vulnerability is exploitable or not is basically the triage process. So starting with the SCA uh, scan, so, uh, so we want to see that it doesn't have a false positive. So we, we look on the dependency, we check that it is indeed a vulnerable version. And then we also look, checking that it's being imported, it is, it, that it's being used also in a vulnerable way, by the way. And then we are uh, looking on the, on the implications. We want to understand what is the risk that we are facing. So we can read the open source information from NVD, from the GitHub Security Advisory, and from all of these sources. And then comes the point where uh, the AppSec professional need to decide if it's going to now focus on remediation, and this means that you, you will going to do uh, uh, something which is not always pleasant, which is talking to the, the developers or their manager and trying to convince them that they need to patch. Or from the other end, that is willing to accept the risk of this vulnerability. So how, how can you decide which way to go? So again, reading the advisory, trying to figure out how difficult it is to patch. Uh, and these days there are also EPSS, which is a good uh, scoring system. Uh, but this case is very, very interesting to, to, to notice that the EPSS of this specific vulnerability is pretty low, which is interesting and we will discuss it further on. So to uh, make it scale, we cannot do this uh, triage for, uh, in our research for every vulnerability. This is why we built this methodology. Thank you, Egal. Um, so now we are about to attack this problem in a scalable way. We cannot um, actually um, uh, look on multiple or thousands of CVs manually and doing all of this triage process. And uh, basically we, are have, we have a five-step methodology. Um, each, of the step, uh, each of the steps requires a different input. Um, and we will dive deep within each one of them. The first one, we are, we are building a dependency graph. So that's a, a, a little bit different from the NPM uh, audit that we ran previously, uh, because we are looking also on all of the manifest files, the requirements, txt, the package.json, and so on. We are building all of the we are building a graph of all of the dependencies and their dependencies, uh, including the transitive one. We are then looking on uh, vulnerabilities coming from those uh, 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 dependencies. Um, we correlate it with all of the dependency graph we have. We are then looking on the imports. As we said, uh, about 10% uh, of all of the packages um, listed on the manifest files are actually not imported within the code itself. Um, so we are taking this uh, as well. And um, we are also looking on the usage, where another 10% um, of the uh, applications which were imported are actually not being used. This could be a developer that uh, changed the dependency to a different one, but uh, keeps their imports and keeps their manifest files. And we are also looking in this stage on how the usage itself um, is being used, which parameters, which arguments, which flags we are passing into the uh, vulnerable uh, dependency. And all of these steps, we are also gathering data and context to finally uh, give all of that into the last step uh, to conclude whether our usage is actually exploitable or the vulnerability we are bringing uh, and actually 
is exploitable within our usage. We are taking all of the data from NVD, the CV description, the GitHub advisories, um, GitHub uh, comments, the mitigation process, the actual uh, requirements for the vulnerability to be exploitable, which flags needs to be um, uh, uh, on. And we are building a prompt that um, we can discuss on how to build a good prompt, but that's a discussion for a different uh, research. And basically, we are taking all of this data, including the usage part and the code, into a prompt builder, which uh, creates the prompt, send it in, into an LLM, which gives us the final verdict, whether the vulnerability is exploitable or not. So as an example, we are taking the previous example of WebSocket, and we are sending the code to OpenAI before you are, shout, you are shouting at me that uh, you will never do it with your private code. Um, so we already checked it with uh, smaller models, local models, uh, Llama 3, and so on, and it gives a pretty high um, uh, good results. So you can also check that. It really depends on how you build the prompt and how you, um, which mechanisms you uh, uh, utilize. So as you can see, we are uh, building a prompt. We are telling it to go to NVD, get a description, and we are also sending the uh, usage itself. And we are getting a response with the final conclusion that the code is actually exploitable, as we have already seen. And we also have a, a mitigation um, um, which OpenAI uh, also gives us. Okay, so coming back to a uh, parse server, which again, just to emphasize that this is a well, well maintained project. You can see by the amount of badges, badges that it has, it screams, trust me, I'm a good project. I'm very, very solid. So uh, you can see that it's also being monitored for security. It has test coverage, etc. So patching is easy. In this case, you have a vulnerable version. This is, this is from their GitHub. Okay, and this is very recent. They, we chose, they deliberately chose a very, very recent example with a very, very recent uh, uh, vulnerability. So they even have the, their uh, sneak in place and they have this automatic patching, very, very good. However, rescanning following this patch, <laughs> this repository, and, and we see that we have the, the same vulnerability not once, but twice. And again, this is the same uh, uh, the same vulnerability. So what's going on here? By the way, you can see that they cut by half the, the amount of total vulnerabilities. They did some more patches in this, uh, uh, in this PR. But basically what, what happens is that WebSocket is not just used as a, as a direct dependency. It was actually uh, being used as a transitive depends, uh, dependency as well. By, by two other packages. So if we are uh, discussing regarding risk management, so we took down uh, one instance of the vulnerability, but we kept two, uh, at least theoretical, two more instances of the same vulnerability still within the application. So, so sorry, any question? All good. So back to the triage process, so much fun. So running uh, NPM audit again, we get uh, those uh, those alerts. You can see that we get the path uh, mentioning where it's coming from, once from a package called subscription uh, transport WS and one from a uh, parse. So again, same process, I will go it very, very quickly. We see that indeed both packages are being imported and they are also being used. Now this parse, package is actually being used very, very, uh, uh, in a very, very uh, uh, simple way. No no uh, usage of its uh, WS uh, transitive dependency. And same goes for uh, the other one. So regarding the risk analysis, so again, we uh, now in the current code base, we have three instances of WS which is quite common in JavaScript project. This is not a problem. So we have the non-vulnerable, which is all green, no problems there. We have uh, the parse uh, module, which has a vulnerable transitive dependency, but no actual vulnerable usage, and same goes for the, for the third one. 
So again, we come back to the decision. If we are going to continue on the remediation process, or we just accept the risk. Now, again, the ball is coming back to, uh, to the AppSec engineer, and it, it needs to decide regarding how it fits with his security program, if it, it's going to have a, a tolerance for risk, or there's no question about it, and they must remediate. So looking on this problem in a different perspective a little bit, or going deeper, we also show that we also um, uh, find that several CWEs um, has different exploitability probability. So some of them resides on the right side, and some of them resides on the left side. Um, it really depends on the behavior of the vulnerability itself. We are going to play a little game. Uh, we have chosen four CWEs, and uh, we need to assign them along the X axis. Um, so let's pick the first one, improper verification of cryptographic signature. Where do you think this resides in? On the right side, which uh, most of the time it will be exploitable, or on the left side? Anyone thinking it's on the right side, please raise your, raise, hand. Raise your hand. Anyone hmm. think left side? Okay, so, so, <laughs> this is actually surprising. Most of the, of these vulnerabilities lies within the, more, tends to be more exploitable. And, and to understand it, it we need to understand that, uh, it comes from the behavior of the vulnerability. So, the uh, vulnerability could lies within, lies because, uh, I mean, excuse me, it, was because of the um, behavior of this vulnerability, which resides be because of the um, hashing algorithms that could be um, old or the uh, using a specific seed which invalidates the encryption itself. And we are talking about vulnerabilities coming from uh, your dependencies and not within your code. So once you are moving, yeah. Just one clarification I think we missed is that uh, we use the methodology to build this kind of data set. We use the methodology that we described earlier. So this data was uh, uh, completely automated. We, are, we ran on thousands of uh, open source repositories, uh, analyzing uh, uh, thousands of vulnerabilities. And this data basically sums up uh, uh, this entire uh, automation process. And we, we chose a very, very uh, restrictive uh, approach regarding what we define as exploitable. Meaning that if there is any slight chance that something is exploitable, we say that it's exploitable because we can, cannot, cannot say otherwise. We say not exploitable only when we have 100% certainty that the vulnerable component of the uh, vulnerable module is not being used at all, or it being used in a non-vulnerable way. Okay, yeah, please take it. Thank you. So, on the next CWE, uh, uncontrolled resource consumption or denial of service. Um, raise your hand if you think it's on the right side. Okay, in the middle. Okay, and on the left side. Great, so <laughs> this is actually in the middle, uh, slightly above the middle, and also this is coming from the behavior of the vulnerability, which la uh, says that in order to actually exploit it, we need uh, a data flow from an adversary or a crafted input, special crafted input, or a, or a, um, a tainted input going into the specific function vulnerable into uh, within the uh, dependency to actually exploit it. So not all of the time the conditions are perfect for this and um, it's uh, above, uh, above the middle. Oops, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so SQL injection. We are talking about the vulnerability not in your actual code base, but uh, uh, SQL injection coming from a dependency that you are bringing to your code. To actually exploit it, you would need all of the stars to align perfectly, where you have a data flow and a tainted input from an adversary coming into the specific um, place where SQL injection could be exploitable. Most of the time, it's not the case. And the last one, 
right side, raise your hand. We are discussing the decellarization of untrusted data. data. Thank you. So right side. Middle. Left side. Left side. Okay, okay. so. So yeah, again in the middle. So this is actually, when, when we saw it the first time, uh, we actually, we, we had uh, some uh, assumption regarding the data. Now, most of them were actually, uh, when we discuss it with some people, uh, th this makes uh, sense to them. So, so basically, th this is what was our alignment with uh, uh, reality. Great. So we will continue to the next research question, which is uh, what's the likelihood of the open source transitive vulnerability to be exploitable? To answer that, we will go back into the WebSocket vulnerability, and we are looking on the um, all of the uh, many vulnerabilities coming um, with the WebSocket, and we are trying to to look on where uh, from where does it come from. Only about five percent of the times it comes as a direct um, a dependency, and most of the time it comes as a transitive one. And as we go deeper and deep, deeper, it will be more less likely to be exploitable. Looking on the general population, we are we are seeing that most of the vulnerabilities are coming actually as a transitive one, but about one third are coming as a direct. And we are also look, seeing here as a nice decay, like as you go deeper and deeper into a more um, a deeper level transitive package uh, vulnerability with the package, then uh, it's less likely to be exploitable. Um, so to answer the, the question we are looking for, we are uh, going to change a little bit the methodology because we cannot actually utilize LLMs for the exploitability of the transitive uh, dependency, we actually can, but it will cost enormous calculations and, and money to, to do that. And um, we will approach it as a statistical uh, method. We are going to build a formula. Uh, I hope you won't be intimidated. It will not be that complex. But uh, I will explain what we are trying to achieve. We are checking uh, for each dependency that we are bringing and all of their dependencies, we are checking what's the probability to be exploitable from um, all of the paths that uh, are coming into our application. And basically we are uh, calculating the complement or how much uh, or how, what's the, the actual risk of not being exploitable on all of the paths and then we are doing the complement of it. So we are iterating over all of the vulnerabilities of all of the vulnerable dependencies. We are using the exploitability factor determined by the CWE we have shown uh, before. And we are taking into account also the depth of the transitive package. And we are using a new um, variable, uh, alpha here, which is a constant between zero and one, uh, which scales the risk um, which calls the risk con contribution um, that comes with the, the based on the depth of the vulnerability. Thank you. So, what happens if we are looking on the dependency graph and we are seeing a lot of uh, transitive vulnerabilities and direct vulnerabilities? So, when we calculate a direct vulnerability then we will uh, have the depth of zero, which invalidates alpha, and we will have uh, to calculate the complement of the complement of the exploitability of the vulnerability, which is just the exploitability uh, factor of that vulnerability, which is fine. And what happens when we scale alpha uh, from zero to one? Basically, it's on um, it's, it's custom for whatever AppSec pro program you have in place. So let's say you have um, many security tools and security circles and, and network security and so on, and you will uh, consider a, a risk acceptance of, of any transitive uh, dependency to be uh, not that high, and you will accept it. So you will choose a higher alpha, closer to one, 
which when we are uh, going to multiply it by the depth, it will have less impact on the exploitability factor we are calculating. On the other side, if you have a, a more strict AppSec program and you want to uh, not include any transitive uh, vulnerability within your progr program, uh, uh, so we are, you could choose a lower alpha. Let's take an example uh, with some numbers, and I will go quickly on it. We have uh, a dependency called Gatsby, which brings uh, another uh, five vulnerabilities, three of them in the depth of one. They are not direct, they are uh, direct of the direct, and two of them are in depth two. We are choosing uh, some numbers for the exploitability factor determined by the CWEs, uh, we can look that uh, two of them have the same, uh, let's say two vulnerabilities have the same CWE, so they are bringing the same exploitability factor. We are going to apply it on the formula. We are going to calculate it, and let's say we chose alpha closer to zero. Taking into account all of these um, calculations, we come up to about 10% risk um, that uh, you are bringing into 10% uh, uh, probability for an exploit on your uh, code based on bringing this uh, vulnerable library. If we are choosing a higher alpha, our risk becomes higher, and therefore uh, we can apply a policy which uh, does not bring this uh, vulnerable dependency into our own code. Yeah, before Thanks. we will move on to uh, the mitigations, so the advantage of getting this number, this uh, risk number, is because today, I'm sure, uh, if, if you manage the open source uh, security program within your organization, I'm sure you are aware that there are a gazillion of vulnerabilities to choose, to choose what, uh, in each uh, day which one you are going to handle. Uh, so this approach basically is it's provide per root cause, meaning per direct vulnerability, it's provide a number. Now you can choose to play how to play with the uh with the with the parameters that you can tune in the formula. But on the bottom line, what you get out of the box is a formula which prod uh, provide you a number between zero to one when which actually enables you to prioritize which uh, vulnerabilities you're going to handle first. Now, and th th this is an important part of the uh, risk assessment, uh, uh, basically to, uh, which allows you better prioritization uh, of uh, your open security uh, backlog. So let's discuss some mitigations uh, which are Pretty uh, trivial, but worth mentioning. So, virtual patching, I don't know if you saw the keynotes today by the uh, CTO of uh, Cloudflare, it was quite good. And he, he discussed the question uh, if uh, uh, machine learning is going to replace all WAF, and his approach was, hell no, it's not going to happen. And for, and there's a good reason for that, I, I agree with him. Uh, Basically, deployments of any WAF or API security, it's, they are very, very efficient in dealing with this kind of vulnerabilities that we saw in the example today. Uh, because obviously, so WebSocket, again, very well-maintained project, fixed the, the open source vulnerability under a month since it was released. Most open source projects think takes a longer while. And even if uh, parse server patch the vulnerability, it doesn't mean that uh, all of the users of this uh, open source application are going to patch it tomorrow as well. This patching process takes a lot of time. This is why virtual patching or deployment of WAF and API security is very important. So if, if you are, you have a very, very low tolerance uh, for a uh, risk in your AppSec program, 
then you can always patch it yourself. So in, in the screenshot, uh, you can see this is the, the PR on par server, which handle the, uh, so not on par server, sorry, on, uh, on WS. And this is the patch they, they, that they did to close the vulnerability. So we can see that it, this is six lines of code, very, very straightforward, just checking if a value is undefined, then something is wrong and, and, and stop handling the request. So if you have a, a, a very low tolerance for risk, you can always uh, patch it yourself. You can either do it on the open source repository and contribute it, or you can do it locally in your private registry and, and do it yourself. So the third recommendation, and if you are dealing with DevSecOps, this is the most realistic one that you should take. Because the first one, was uh, which was deploy of a WAF or API security product, this involves the, the guys doing network security or cloud security. The second one was about developers, because you needed to, uh, developers to make this patch, and it's to deploy, uh, to deploy the, if, if it's going to be for the open source repository or to your private registry, this is software developer work. Now, the options that I'm describing now is simpler, and th this is in the end of the, uh, in most cases at least, in the end of the DevSecOps engineer, which is simply to schedule a rebuild of all of the applications. So, like, just rerunning the pipeline, uh, usually, uh, it's, it's fetching the base image of the container, assuming that this is a container. Now, uh, the way that uh, uh, it works with the public registry, unlike software uh, packages, which all, uh, the version has a fixed hash, so with containers, uh, there is no su such case, and a lot of times uh, patches are getting uh, pushed to uh, uh, the same image. So you can Im uh, pull an image today, and you can pull an image tomorrow and you will get a different version. Uh, so uh, and usually it includes uh, software uh, security patches. But it's not only about containers. Also in, uh, in open source packages such as on the NPM uh, ecosystem, uh, it's not enough to just run the pipeline because usually the, uh, the lock file, like package lock uh, uh, JSON or yarn.lock, it's uh, committed to the repository, which is good. So you need to to invalidate it as well, and this is could be completely automated again from the DevSecOps uh, process. Now, the, the good news is that most vulnerabilities that do have uh, do have uh, uh, patches uh, for them. So this data comes from uh, Debs Dev. It's a pro, uh, very very nice uh, site. Uh, uh, operate by uh, uh, Google. So what we can see here is that 70% of the vulnerabilities on the NPM ecosystem do get patches. Now you can look on the on the half side, uh, half part of the uh, empty side of the glass, and you will see that 30% does not uh, of the vulnerability does not have a, a software patch. But I guess that if you are using uh, uh, one of those then it's probably an, a deprecated package or, some, or a package that you shouldn't uh, use anyway. But 70% is also a nice percentage. Now, to have this process, of course, you must have a, a DevSecOps culture with also a, a, a simple uh, test running in the pipeline, automation test, because uh, patching may break your application. This is important to mention. So this is only if you are a mature, you have a mature uh, a pipeline ecosystem. So before we wrap up, we want to discuss some of the future work that we have now ongoing. So in, in so far in our research in the past few months, we, we focused on JavaScript ecosystem, which is the, the largest ecosystem in the open source community. Almost uh, one million uh, open source packages just on NPM. 
And, and we, we, we did so that the, uh, uh, the, vo the different CVEs under the same CWE classification behave very, very similarly uh, from the exploitability level. And we want to explore it for other languages as well, for the Python ecosystem, Java ecosystem, etc. Uh, one more aspect that we want to explore is the usage of LLM. It, it proved itself very, very useful for uh, direct uh, uh, vulnerability exploit. We, we, we do want to return to it and try to make it work for uh, transitive depend, uh, vulnerabilities as well. Uh, and briefly, earlier I, I discussed uh, uh, EPSS when I showed that a vulnerability which is very, very simple to exploit. I, uh, this is why I was surprised it, it got a, a, a relatively low EPSS score. So looking forward, we really want to, to see a correlation. Maybe, you know, it, maybe I will take a minute to explain about EPSS. So EPSS basically is a, is a model which predicts which CVEs are going to be uh, exploited or, or attempted to be exploited in the wild. And this is a nice project maintained by, uh, by the guys from uh, FIRST. So what is interesting to see that when we are looking on, a, on our scoring system, out, uh, to see if we can predict the change in the prediction of the EPSS. Again, because this is a new vulnerability, it might be that the EPSS uh, uh, risk score is not uh, mature enough to handle uh, new vulnerabilities, and this is why we get a, a new score, a, a low score. So this is, again, something that we are planning to look on. And we were, uh, uh, <laughs> So we were accepted to continue the discussion on Blackhead US, so if you will be on Blackhead, I hope to see you there if you found this talk interesting. And just before we wrap up, uh, uh, we have a team, uh, uh, two more uh, 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 team members who took part of this research, Adi and Talia, so uh, thank you. They could not be here uh, today, but we thank them for the contrib contribution of this research. So thank you. Thank you so much for the talk. Uh, now it's Q&A. Does anyone have any questions for the for our presenters today? Uh, well, I have some myself. So I wanted to ask you, we talked a little bit on the probabilities, but I also want to know about your personal experiences. Have you found already any transitive dependency that was exploitable in the wild? Yes, so we did. Uh, we try to make the, the talk uh, very, very concise regarding the POCs because it's not very exciting. You just run run some script and you see like the application crashes. But uh, uh, so we didn't put it in. But it is uh, quite common. And again, the 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 uh, the reason for that is because there are so many. Uh, uh, so and again, the CWEs who usually. Uh, are more and more easy to exploit in the wild, are the ones, as shown, as discussed earlier, uh, encry encryption stuff are, ve uh, are very, very uh, easy to exploit. Not necessarily very, very interesting or, ne or very exciting, but relatively easy to exploit. Okay, thank you. And do you have any specific language that you know that is that has uh, more uh, exploitable trusted vulnerabilities that you know of? Yeah, so again, one of the reasons that we chose JavaScript to, to lead this research, well, well, we have also preliminary numbers on, on Python, Go, and Java, but not to discuss today, but specifically on JavaScript because we saw on, on previously on the, on the chart by Depth Dev that JavaScript has a big hole of unpatched vulnerabilities. Now, these vulnerabilities sometimes are in unmaintained packages, which are so deep in the chain of the dependency chain, which they are uh, uh, relatively, e for, for relatively easy to exploit, and nobody going to patch them ever. So again, uh, this is what makes the JavaScript ecosystem so interesting. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, everyone, and a big applause for our presenters today.
Thank you. Thank you.